Hi, my name is Katie Zeckman, and welcome to my podcast on animal behavior. Today, we're going to be diving deeper into the mating patterns that we discuss in animal behavior, a pattern that's more rare than monogamy itself in the animal kingdom. We're going to be talking about homosexuality, a behavioral trait that's been found in many different species. We'll be exploring the research done on homosexuality and how we can answer Tinbergen's four questions with this particular behavioral trait. To begin, there have been many recorded examples of homosexual behavior exhibited in monogamous animals such as the emperor penguin, as well as polygamous animals like bonobos, mountain gorillas, dolphins, and even giraffes. There was actually quite the adorable story that happened just this past September in the Denmark Zoo when two gay penguins adopted a neglected chick that had been left by its parents. And in October, a pair of Gen 2 penguins raised their first chick after nesting together for years. In the Sydney Zoo in Australia, Sven and Magic are two male penguins that have been nesting together for years, and they were finally granted their own egg by zookeepers to adopt after years of them showing behavior of wanting to be parents by incubating a stone during the nesting season to act as if they were raising their own chick. Another funny story happened this summer with gay parents. At a lake in Austria, two male swans were ferociously attacking people that walked by, protecting their egg from their nest. Their egg happened to be a colorful plastic cup, but they didn't care and they fought ferociously, trying to drown swimmers and chasing people away, giving them cuts and scratches. It got so bad that they actually needed to be captured and taken to an animal wildlife reserve nearby. There are so many adorable animal stories of homosexual couples in zoos and even in the wild, and there are many anecdotes about these animals. But the research has been pretty sparse. We really don't know how widespread homosexual behavior is in the animal kingdom. Though growing, the body of scientific work studying homosexual behavior in animals is still very small and only scratches the surface of what is there. Homosexual behavior has been observed as early as 300 AD by Aristotle, who found examples of pigeons and quails mating with members of the same sex. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics in the 4th century AD found examples of hyenas mating together and female couplings. And there was even a review of homosexual tendencies in animals written by zoologist Ferdinand Hack in 1900. However, not until recently has homosexual behavior been officially observed by the scientific community. There are a couple theories as to why this is. The first being observer bias caused by social attitudes and understanding of same-sex behavior. If the researchers don't know what homosexual behavior and sexual acts are, they can't really observe and describe and report them. Another more commonly held theory is that scientists were afraid to research this topic out of fear of ridicule by the scientific community, being ostracized by the church community, and even having their grants taken away being viewed as non-essential research. Georgetown University biologist Janet Mann said that scientists who study the topic are often accused of trying to push an agenda, and that research they publish can come under a lot more scrutiny than scientists who propose a different explanation for the behavior exhibited. Quite similarly to the way some research is treated in the global warming community. A third theory as to why there isn't much research that shows homosexual tendencies in animals is that it's often overlooked by researchers. For example, Bruce Bagneal, author of the book Biological Exuberance, Animal Homosexuality and Natural Diversity, talked about how overlooked homosexual behavior is in giraffes, where 9 out of the 10 pairings occur between males, and yet every male that sniffed a female was reported as sex, while actual anal intercourse with orgasm between males was only revolving around dominance, competition, or greeting. Researchers and scientists have often been writing off this homosexual behavior as examples of other types of social behavior. And so even though we have observed the behavior for more than 2,000 years, the amount of research has really only been consolidated into the past 20, 30 years. 
So since we've now talked about the research done on homosexual behavior in animals, let's now focus on why. Why and how is it that this trait is present in animals? Like most behaviors discussed in animal behavior, let's take a look at the four questions that Tim Bergen asks. First, what are the mechanisms that allow for this behavior to happen? Second, how did this behavior develop? How did they learn how to do this? Third, what function or purpose does it serve for the individual? And finally, fourth, what could be the evolutionary reason as to why this behavior exists? The first three questions are pretty non-controversial to answer logically. I mean, let's think about the mechanisms. All animals have the genitalia or body parts needed in order to perform homosexual acts. And then the hormonal drives and hormones that are coursing through these animals give them that desire to have sex. Nerve centers send pleasure signals to the brain. Their bodies are equipped for sex. It really doesn't matter the gender of their partner. When answering the second question, how would it develop and how did they learn it, there are a couple of different possible explanations. They could have learned the behavior by seeing others partake in homosexual acts. They could possibly have observed it from homosexual parents that might have adopted them, like the penguins did at the two different zoos. Or they could simply observe it from other females or males in their social groups. It could even be a journey of self-discovery. Just like in humans, when they're in their teenage years and awkwardly fumbling through trying to understand what sex is and how to do it. In many animals, it's a journey of self-discovery from learning with friends or by themselves. They may learn by playing with others and simply discovering it. And feeling that it felt good, they start to continue to practice. When talking about function when it comes to sexual acts, your first thought is usually to reproduce but that isn't the only possible function for sex. It can also be used for pleasure or to improve bonds between individuals and social groups, and it can even be used simply to release tension or pass time. I mean, humans developed contraception to stop that main function of sex, and so if that was the only function, there would be no reason for us to have sex without the reproductive qualities. Homosexual acts just like most sexual acts, are used for the same purposes, to release tension, pass time, have pleasure, feel good, or improve bonds. There might not be any females or males around, and so they simply take what they can get and have sex with what's available, which might be members of their own gender. It's Tinbergen's fourth question where things start to get tricky. How can the trait of homosexuality have evolved if it can't be passed down genetically through homosexual couples? The short answer is you can't say that homosexual couples got the traits from their ancestors because homosexual ancestors didn't reproduce. And so they couldn't pass on their genetic traits. It creates a really interesting paradox on the continued prevalence of homosexual behavior across generations. You would think through natural selection that if homosexual couples don't reproduce as much as straight couples, that through generations their numbers would dwindle and dwindle as the gene pool shifts away from homosexual behavior. However, the frequency of homosexual traits in animals has not really changed throughout generations. There has been no measurable decrease. A possible simple explanation could be that the homosexual behaviors exhibited are not genetically coded then, and that's why the frequency of the traits are not changed through generations. But this would contradict the basic nature versus nurture standard that we currently have agreed upon, in which all behavioral traits have both a nature and a nurture component, meaning they have a genetic component and an environmental component. So how could we possibly explain the prevalence of this genetic component even though it's not fit for natural selection? If individuals that have homosexual behavior don't reproduce as much, how can their traits be passed on? There are a couple theories. The first is that the genes that code for homosexual behavior also do other things. 
one way that an allele that has coding for homosexual behavior, or a gay allele, might be able to compensate for a reproductive deficit is by having an effect on the opposite sex that is stronger. An allele that makes its carriers more attracted to men has an obvious reproductive advantage for women. And so if it appears in the man's genetic code, as long as the benefits are stronger for the women than the deficits found by the man being attracted to another man, the trait can be passed on. And this same-sex attraction can be viewed as that gay allele. Another possible theory is that it's not really about the DNA, but about the actual gestation period. Exposure to unusual levels of hormones before birth can affect the sexuality. For example, female fetuses exposed to higher levels of testosterone before birth in humans show a higher rate of lesbianism than in women that have not been exposed to higher levels of testosterone. A third very possible theory is that a singular gay gene is a serious oversimplification and the genetic components determining one's sexuality are much more complex involving tens or even hundreds of alleles. And so even if heterosexual sex is more advantageous evolutionarily, the exhibiting of gay traits is so complicated in the alleles that it really doesn't make that big of a difference. There's also evidence that homosexual behavior can actually benefit the individual and help them to pass on their genes. For example, male fruit flies in the first 30 minutes of their life will try to mate with any fruit fly, male or female, and then after a while they start to realize what the smell of virgin female smells like and learn to focus on them. It's a process of trial and error, but it's beneficial to them because it keeps them from ruling out smells that they don't recognize and so, and therefore missing an opportunity to mate. It's a bit of a quantity over quality strategy, but it works for them and it helps to pass on their genes and gives them a better likelihood. An example in monogamy might be the Laysan albatross in Hawaii. These birds mate for life, and yet almost a third of the pairings are between two unrelated females. These females are committed to each other season after season, and yet they still rear chicks fathered by males that are cheating on their pair, pretty much the equivalent of an egg donor or sperm donor. These females then raise it just like the regular heterosexual pair, as it's better for them to work together than to try to rear a chick on their own. There are even subtle advantages for the females that pair with each other, as the system means that they get their eggs fertilized by the fittest males of the group that can cheat on their pairs. And so the donated genetics from the males can give their offspring more desirable traits. What do you think could be the reason as to why homosexual behavior has not been eradicated through evolutionary means? Is it hormonal? Could it be that homosexual couples still have a donor to continue their lineage? Much like lesbians can use a sperm donor and gay men can use a surrogate to carry their children. Or could it be something else entirely? No one yet really knows for sure. Thank you for joining me in exploring the phenomenon of homosexuality in the animal kingdom. I hope you enjoyed and you'll listen again soon. Signing off, this is Katie Zekman.